in our second meeting today. So I think we're ready to start and we'll start appropriately uh, with a word of prayer. So let's come together as a family and pray. Our Father, at this time of chaos, we give thanks that you are still God. We give thanks that you are still on your throne. We give thanks that you are still in charge. We give thanks that none of this chaos changes your love for us. None of this chaos changes the fact that Jesus died for us. And none of this chaos can affect our salvation. And we pray, Father, that in this time of social distancing, we might actually be drawn closer together as a family of brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray that we might draw closer to you also and have a, a new desire to get to know you better. Father God, help us to be aware of new opportunities that you give us to reach out to our community and to draw them into your kingdom. Father God, in amongst all the noise, may we hear your voice come through clearly. Help us to keep our eyes fixed firmly upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm going to read from the scriptures now. I'm, I'd like to read from uh, 1 Kings, verse 19. Uh, I beg your pardon, chapter 19. 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 9 to 13. And it says this. And the word of the Lord came to him, that's Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Just wanted to remind us that in all the chaos, in all the noise that's out there on the news, on social media, and just amongst ourselves when we meet and talk, then amongst all the chaos and amongst all the noise, we need to stop and just listen to the quiet, still voice of God. Let's listen to what he's saying to us. I'm conscious of the fact this morning as well that it's Mother's Day. And of course, many of us uh, will be missing our mums today. Many of you who are mums will be missing your children. Um, and I'm going to selfishly take this opportunity to wish my mum happy Mother's Day because she's joined us today. Um, so happy Mother's Day, mum. Um, and let's just remember that there are lots of uh, mums out there who were missing their children and lots of children who are missing their mums. Um, so I've just noticed there were two people waiting to join. I've just allowed them in. So welcome to anybody who's late. And I'm sorry if I was a bit slow to, to let you into the meeting there. So I want to bring the word to you. And I want to take a look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. And I wanted to just explain a little bit about why I chose this passage. I think it's probable that we might have to meet like this virtually over the computers for quite some weeks to come. So I thought it would be a good idea to pick a book and to start to work through a book. And I've chosen Colossians. And one of the reasons that I chose Colossians was because the opening verses that we're going to have a look at in a moment uh, to describe Paul praying 
for the church in Colossae. And at this time, when it's more important than ever, I think, for us to be praying for one another, I thought these verses give us a good example, a model of how we might be able to pray for one another. So we're going to look at the scripture and then we're going to look in a little bit more depth at how uh, we can use these, uh, these words of scripture to form a model to pray for one another. What I'm going to do now, if you'll bear with me, is I'm going to try and open a screen that will bring up the scripture. Um, you'll soon see that I'm no expert here, but it's on its way. All right, so I'm hoping that you're all now seeing a blue screen that says our church is not closed. And then hopefully now you can all see the scripture reading. So I'm going to read through this. So Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you have learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This morning, I'd like to just zoom in and focus on a few of those verses, and it's verses 9 to 11. And just to recap, this is what those verses say. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. So these are the verses I'd like to, uh, to, to, to look at this morning and to try and break that down into uh, a model, a pattern for praying for others. So we can break it down into these seven different categories, I think. We can pray for others to be filled with the knowledge of his will, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to bear good fruit, to grow in the knowledge of God, to be filled with God's power, to have great endurance and patience, and to be filled with God's joy. So the first of these, to be filled with the knowledge of his will. One thing to note here is it doesn't say to know God's will. It says to be filled with the knowledge of his will. And I think there's a subtle difference. If we are filled with something, then we're controlled by it. If I was filled with rage and anger, I would be controlled by rage and anger. If I was filled with jealousy, I would be controlled by jealousy. But if I'm filled with the knowledge of the will of God, 
then I'm controlled by the will of God. And this affects the way I live. It affects the things I do. If I'm controlled by the will of God, then it controls the way I spend my money. It controls the way I use my time. It controls the way I treat others. And it controls the way that I respond to other people's needs. If you've had periods in your life where you've been filled with the knowledge of his will, you'll know that it's a time and a period of amazing blessing. Being in God's will is the greatest place to be. So why wouldn't you want that for your friends and your family? Why wouldn't you include that in your prayers for others? Number two says to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. If I was going to apply for a loan, I would be checked to see if I was credit worthy. If I was a reporter trying to make the six o'clock news, my story would have to be newsworthy. Each year, I have to take my car for an MOT to prove that it is roadworthy. And every time I step out of my door and into the world, I have to walk in a manner that is Lord worthy. I wonder if you've ever prayed that you would be credit worthy. Maybe you've been applying for, uh, to rent a house or to get a mortgage to buy a house. And so you pray that God will, will look after you in that situation, that you will be credit worthy and you will be approved for your new home. Have you ever had to pray that your car will pass the MOT? To pray that your car will be deemed roadworthy? What about being Lord worthy? Do we pray that we are Lord worthy? Do we pray for our friends and our family that they would become Lord worthy? And then what about to bear good fruit? Obviously, we are, most of us will know about the fruit of the Spirit. I wonder how many of them we know. Interesting, isn't it, that uh, in a church service, a traditional one, where we all gather together and meet in the same place, when the preacher says, how many of the fruits of the Spirit can you name? And you sit there in blind panic as you know them, but your, your mind just goes blank, doesn't it? Then you're afraid to speak out in case you get one wrong and you feel publicly humiliated. Well, in this environment, in the quiet and the peace and the secrecy of your own home, you can start to try and name fruits of the Spirit, can't you? And, and know that nobody else is listening. So just in a few moments of, of quiet, just see how many you can come up with. So here in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, we find them and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. One thing strikes me about this, and it says the fruit of the Spirit is. Now that's all singular. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit are. It's not like a shopping list, not a list where you pick some of them and leave others, or, or some are attributed to you and others are not. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. So all these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, they are one thing, one package. They are the fruit of the Spirit. And our fourth one, to grow in the knowledge of God. The whole of scripture points to, points to Jesus. The whole of scripture is about Jesus. The whole of scripture reveals Jesus. And if we want to grow in the knowledge of God, then we need to read the scripture. Because in discovering Jesus, in seeing Jesus, we see God. Here's two scripture readings. First of all, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And then in John chapter 14, verses 7 to 12, 
If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? It's clear from, from the scripture, isn't it? That to know the Father, we have to know the Son. And as I said, the scriptures reveal Jesus. And so by reading the scripture, as Jesus is revealed to us, and we come to know him and see him, so we come to know the Father also. Um, I beg your pardon, my computer has just stopped because um, I've got another scripture reading I'd like to show you, but it's not coming up. And I know that I've got more coming up in a minute. Ah, there it is. Thank you. So Hebrews chapter one, verse three. He, that's Jesus again, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So what is it to be filled with God's power? God's power is just so awesome and so amazing. It's a job to know where to start to talk about God's power. But I'd like to start with a scripture um, from... Um, from Job. Um, bear with me a sec again while I just move something on my screen because I can't see. Right. So I'd like to read to you from Job 26 verses 7 to 14. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not split open under them. He covers the face of the full moon and spreads over it his cloud. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he shattered Rahab. By his wind, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways. And how small a whisper do we hear of him? But the thunder of his power, who can understand? God's power is just so awesome, isn't it? Um, we just read that bit high, I've now highlighted in red. Look, behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways. And how small a whisper do we hear of him? Everything we know, everything we see, everything we hear of the power of God is just a shadow of the total of God's power. God's power is awesome. It's amazing. And God invites us to be filled with this power. But how do we access it? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the word of the cross is the power of God. And the power of God is given to us when we accept the gift of salvation. When we receive the gift of salvation, we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and with it access to God's power. Salvation comes from faith and faith comes from reading the word. We know that from Romans chapter 10, verse 17. <clears throat> Let's just take all those little bits of information and put them in order. So we read the word. From reading the word, we build our faith. Through faith, we receive salvation. When we receive salvation, we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it is through the gift of the Holy Spirit that we have the power of God in us. Point number six, to have great endurance and patience. So what does the Bible have to say to us about endurance? 
Romans chapter 5, verses 4 and 6. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Give me a moment while I just take a drink. And then James chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So we're possibly heading into a time of great trial, a time that will demand endurance. We might begin to wonder where God is in all of this. We might be challenged by other people. Where is your God during our time of suffering? Well, I'll tell you where our God is during this time of suffering. Our God is on his knees with the mother of a child whom she cannot feed. God is with the weeping man who is worried because he cannot pay his mortgage and keep a, house, a roof over his family's head. God is cradling the child who has lost a parent. I'll tell you where God is. God is right in the midst of all our suffering. So when we pray, why do we pray to be removed from suffering when the God that we yearn for is right in the heart of our suffering? What we're called to pray for is endurance. Endurance to get through that suffering. And knowing that in our suffering, we are sharing in the suffering of Christ. And in doing so, we become heirs to the kingdom of heaven. Point number seven, to be filled with God's joy. There's no other joy like God's joy. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There are so many places where we look for joy that are transient and can disappear in a heartbeat. If we look around, people are losing their jobs, their homes, and even loved ones. Now, of course, these are things where we do find joy in our jobs, in our homes, and obviously in our loved ones. But they are for a season and they can be taken away from us. But if we look for our love and our joy in God, God the same yesterday, today and forever, a God who never changes, then our joy will be complete. It will be constant and it will be eternal. God is the giver of all good things and he wants us to find joy in them. But above all, he wants us to find joy in him. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So to recap, we we'll call to pray for others. How do we pray for others? Paul has given us this wonderful model that we can use to pray for others here in Colossians. We can pray for others <clears throat> to be filled with the knowledge of his will, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to bear good fruit, to grow in the knowledge of God, to be filled with God's power, to have great endurance and patience, and to be filled with God's joy. So I would like to encourage you this week in your period of isolation, draw up a list of people that you can pray for. Start with a list of your brothers and sisters in our church family. Use the contact list for all the names. Then commit to pray for three people a day. Set aside a time of day when you can pray every day. And use the model of Paul and pray all these things for each person. And really important, keep a note of every time that you see God answer prayer. 
that will be of great encouragement to you. And above all, in all things, give thanks. Amen.